Much of the controversy arises from the belief that it promised something to somebody and that this promise was in conflict with other promises, notably with the McMahon plan to Sharif Hussein. The Balfour Declaration took the form of a letter from British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour to Lord Rothschild, one of the leading figures in the British Zionist movement. This movement, which was much stronger in Austria and Germany than in Britain, had aspirations for creating in Palestine, or perhaps elsewhere, some territory to which refugees from anti-Semitic persecution or other Jews could go to find a national home. Balfour's letter said, His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights of and political status enjoyed by the Jews in any other country. It is to be noted that this was neither an agreement nor a promise, but merely a unilateral declaration that it did not promise a Jewish state in Palestine, or even Palestine as a home for the Jews, but merely proposed such a home in Palestine, and that it reserved certain rights from the, for the existing groups in the area. Hussein was also distressed when he heard of it that he asked for an explanation and was assured by D.G. Hogarth on behalf of the British government that Jewish settlements in Palestine would only be allowed in so far as would be consistent with the political and economic freedom of the Arab population. This reassurance apparently was acceptable to Hussein but doubts continued among other Arab leaders. In answer to a request from seven such leaders on June 16, 1980, Britain gave a public answer which divided the Arab territories into three parts. A. The Arabian Peninsula from Aden to Aqaba at the head of the Red Sea, where the complete and sovereign independence of the Arabs was recognized. B. The area under British military occupation covering southern Palestine and southern Mesopotamia, where Britain accepted the principle that government should be based on the consent of the governed. And C. The area still under Turkish control, including Syria and northern Mesopotamia, where Britain assumed the obligation to strive for freedom and independence. Somewhat similar in tone was a joint Anglo-French declaration of November 7, 1918, just four days before hostilities ended in the war. It promised the complete and final liberation of the peoples who have for so long been oppressed by the Turk and the setting up of national government and administrations that shall derive their authority from the free exercise of the initiative and choice of the indigenous population. There have been extended discussions of the compatibility of the various agreements and statements made by the great powers regarding the disposition of the Ottoman Empire after the war. This is a difficult problem in view of the inaccuracy and ambiguity of the wording of most of these documents. On the other hand, certain facts are quite evident. There is a sharp contrast between the imperialist avarice to be found in the secret agreements like Sykes-Picot and the altruistic tone of the publicly issued statement. There is also a sharp contrast between the tenor of the British negotiations with the Jews and those with the Arabs regarding the disposition of Palestine with the result that Jews and Arabs were each justified in believing that Britain would promote their conflicting political ambitions in that area. 
These beliefs, whether based on misunderstanding or deliberate deception, subsequently served to reduce the stature of Britain in the eyes of both groups, although both had previously held a higher opinion of British fairness and generosity than of, than of any other power. Lastly, the raising of false Arab hopes and the failure to reach any clear and honest understanding regarding Syria led to a long period of conflict between the Syrians and the French government, which held the area as a mandate of the League of Nations after 1923. As a result of his understanding of the negotiations with McMahon, Hussein began an Arab revolt against Turkey on June 5, 1916. From that point on, he received a subsidy of £225,000 a month from Britain. The famous T. E. Lawrence, known as Lawrence of Arabia, who had been an archaeologist in the Near East in 1914, had nothing to do with the negotiations with Hussein and did not join the revolt until October 1916. When Hussein did not obtain the concessions he expected at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, Lawrence sickened of the whole affair and eventually changed his name to Shaw and tried to vanish from public view. The Arab territories remained under military occupation until the legal establishment of peace with Turkey in 1923. Arabia itself was under a number of sheikhs, of which the chief were Hussein in Hejaz and Ibn Saud in Nej. Palestine and Mesopotamia, now called Iraq, were under British military occupation. The coast of Syria was under French military occupation, while the interior of Syria, including the Aleppo-Damascus railway line and Transjordan, were under an Arab force led by Emir Faisal, third son of Hussein of Mecca. Although an American Commission of Inquiry, known as the King Crane Commission 1919, and a General Syrian Congress of Arabs from the Hale Pertal Crescent recommended that France be excluded from the area, that Syria, Palestine be joined to form a single state with Faisal as king, that the Zionists be excluded from Palestine in any political role, as well as other points, a meeting of the great powers at San Remo in April 1920 set up two French and two British mandates. Syria and Lebanon went to France, while Iraq and Palestine, including Transjordan, went to Britain. There were Arab uprisings and great local unrest following these decisions. The resistance in Syria was crushed by the French, who then advanced to occupy the interior of Syria and sent Faisal into exile. The British, who by this time were engaged in a rivalry over petroleum resources and other issues with the French, set Faisal up as king in Iraq under British protection, 1921 and placed his brother Abdallah in a similar position as King of Transjordan, 1923. The father of the two new kings, Hussein, was attacked by Ibn Saud of Najd and forced to abdicate in 1924. His kingdom of Hejaz was annexed by Ibn Saud in 1926. After 1932, this whole area was known as Saudi Arabia. The most important diplomatic event of the latter part of the First World War was the intervention of the United States on the side of the Entente Powers in April 1917. The causes of this event have been analyzed at great length. In general, there have been four chief reasons given for the intervention from four quite different points of view. These might be summarized as follows. 1. The German submarine attacks and neutral shipping made it necessary for the United States to go to war to secure, quote, freedom of the seas. 2. The United States was influenced by subtle British propaganda conducted in drawing rooms, universities, and the press of the eastern part of the country where 
Anglophilism was rampant among the more influential social group. Three, the United States was inveigled into the war by a conspiracy of international bankers and munitions manufacturers eager to protect their loans to the Entente powers or their wartime profits from sales to these powers. And four, balance of power principles made it impossible for the United States to allow Great Britain to be defeated by Germany. Whatever the weight of these four in the final decision, it is quite clear that neither the government nor the people of the United States were prepared to accept a defeat of the Entente at the hands of the central powers. Indeed, in spite of the government's efforts to act with a certain semblance of neutrality, it was clear in 1940 that this was the view of the chief leaders in the government, with a single exception of Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan. Without analyzing the four factors mentioned above, it is quite clear that the United States could not allow Britain to be defeated by any other power. Separated from all other great powers by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the security of America required either that the control of these oceans be in its own hands or in the hands of a friendly power. For almost a century before 1917, the United States had been willing to allow British control of the sea to go unchallenged, because it was clear that British control of the sea provided no threat to the United States, but on the contrary, provided security for the United States at a smaller cost in wealth and responsibility than security could have been obtained by any other method. The presence of Canada as a British territory adjacent to the United States and exposed to invasion by land from the United States consists, constituted a hostage for British naval behaviour acceptable to the United States. The German submarine assault on Britain early in 1917 drove Britain close to the door of starvation by its ruthless sinking of the merchant shipping upon which Britain's existence depended. Defeat of Britain could not be permitted because the United States were not prepared to take over control of the sea itself and could not permit German control of the sea because it had no assurance regarding the nature of such German control. The fact that the German submarines were acting in retaliation for the illegal British blockade of the continent of Europe and British violations of international law and neutral rights on the high seas, the fact that the Anglo-Saxon heritage of the United States and the Anglophilism of its influential classes made it impossible for the average American to see world events except for the spectacles made by British propaganda, the fact that Americans had lent the entente billions of dollars which would be jeopardized by a German victory, the fact that the enormous entente purchases of war material had created a boom of prosperity and inflation which would collapse the very day that the entente collapsed, all these factors were able to bring weight to bear on the American decision only because the balance of power issue laid a foundation on which they could work. The important fact was that Britain was close to defeat in April 1917. And on that basis, the United States entered the war. The unconscious assumptions by American leaders that an Entente victory was both necessary and inevitable was at the bottom of their failure to enforce the same rules of neutrality and international law against Britain as against Germany. They constantly assumed that British violations of these rules could be compensated with monetary damages while German violations of these rules must be resisted by force if necessary, since they could not admit this unconscious assumption of, or publicly defend the legitimate basis of international power politics on which it rested, they finally went to war on, on an excuse which was legally weak, although emotionally satisfying. As John Bassett Moore, America's most famous international lawyer, put it, what most decisively contributed to the involvement of the United States in the war 
was the assertion of a right to protect belligerent ships on which Americans saw fit to travel, and the treatment of armed belligerent merchantmen as peaceful vessels. Both assumptions were contrary to reason and to settled law, and no other professed neutral advanced them. The Germans at first tried to <coughs> use the established rules of international law regarding destruction of merchant vessels. This proved so dangerous because of the peculiar character of the submarine itself. <coughs> British control of the high seas, the British instructions to merchant ships to attack submarines, and the difficulty of distinguishing between British ships and neutral ships that most German submarines tended to attack without warning. American protests reached a peak when the Lusitania was sunk in this way nine miles off the English coast on May 7, 1915. The Lusitania was a British merchant vessel constructed with government funds as an auxiliary cruiser, expressly included in the Navy list published by the British Admiralty with bases slate for mounting guns of 6-inch caliber, carrying a cargo of 2,400 cases of rifle cartridges and 1,250 cases of shrapnel, and with orders to attack German submarines whenever possible. 785 of 1,257 passengers, including uh, 100. Uh, 28 of 197 Americans lost their lives. The incompetence of the acting captain contributed to the heavy loss, as did also a mysterious second explosion after the German torpedo struck. The vessel, which had been declared unsinkable, went down in 18 minutes. The captain was on, on a course he had orders to avoid, he was running at reduced speed. He had an inexperienced crew. The portholes had been left open. The lifeboats had not been swung out, and no lifeboat drills had been held. The propaganda agencies of the Entente Pass made full use of the occasion. The Times of London announced that four fifths of her passengers were citizens of the United States. The actual proportion was 15.6%. The British manufactured and distributed a medal which they pretended had been awarded to the submarine crew by the German government. A French paper published a picture of the crowds in Berlin at the outbreak of war in 1914 as a picture of Germans rejoicing at news of the sinking of the Lusitania. The United States protested violently against the submarine warfare while brushing aside German arguments based on the British blockade. Uh, it was so irreconcilable in these protests that Germany sent Wilson a note on May 4th, 1916, in which it promised that in the future merchant vessels within and without the war zone shall not be sunk without warning and without safeguarding human lives unless these ships attempt to escape or offer resistance. In return, the German government hoped that the United States would put pressure on Britain to follow the established rules of international law in regard to blockade and freedom of the sea. Wilson refused to do so. Accordingly, it became clear to the Germans that they would be starved into defeat unless they could defeat Britain first by unrestricted submarine warfare. Since they were aware that resort to this method would probably bring the United States into, into the war against them, they made another effort to negotiate peace before resorting to it. When their offer to negotiate, made on December 12, 1916, was rejected by the Entente Pars on December 27, the group in the German government which had been advocating ruthless submarine warfare came into a position to control affairs and ordered the resumption of unrestricted submarine attacks on February 1, 1917. Wilson was notified of this decision on January 31st. He broke off diplomatic relations with Germany on February 3rd, 
and after two months of indecision asked the Congress for a declaration of war, April 3, 1917. The final decision was influenced by the constant pressure of his closest associates. The realization that Britain was reaching the end of her resources of men, money and ships, and the knowledge that Germany was planning to seek an alliance with Mexico if war began. While the diplomacy of neutrality and intervention was moving along, the lines we have described, a parallel diplomatic effort was being directed toward efforts to negotiate peace. These efforts were a failure, but are nonetheless of considerable significance because they reveal the motivations and war aims of the belligerents. They were a failure because any negotiated peace requires a willingness on both sides to make the, those concessions which will permit the continued survival of the enemy. Uh, in, from 1914 to 1918, however, in order to win public support for total mobilization, each country's propaganda had been directed toward a total victory for itself and total defeat for the enemy. In time, both sides became so enmeshed in their own propaganda that it became impossible to admit publicly one's readiness to accept such lesser aims as any negotiated peace would require. Moreover, as the tide of battle waxed and waned, giving alternate periods of elation and discouragement to both sides, the side which was temporarily elated became increasingly attached to the fetish of total victory and unwilling to accept the lesser aim of a negotiated peace. Accordingly, peace became possible only when war weariness had reached a point where one side concluded that even defeat was preferable to continuation of the war. This point was reached in Russia in 1917 and in Germany and Austria in 1918. In Germany, this point of view was greatly reinforced by the realization that military defeat and political change were preferable to the economic revolution and social upheaval which would accompany any effort to continue the war in pursuit of an increasingly unattainable victory. From the various efforts to negotiate peace, it is clear that Britain was unwilling to accept any peace which would not include the restoration of Belgium or which would leave Germany supreme on the continent, or in a position to resume the commercial, naval and colonial rivalry which had existed before 1914. France was unwilling to accept any solution which did not restore Alsace-Lorraine to her. The German high command and the German industrialists were determined not to give up all the occupied territory in the west, but were hoping to retain Lorraine, part of Alsace, Luxembourg, part of Belgium, and Longwy in France because of the mineral and industrial resources of these areas. The fact that Germany had an excellent supply of coking coal with an inadequate supply of iron ore, while the occupied areas had plenty of the latter, but an inadequate supply of the former, had a great deal to do with the German objections to a negotiated peace and the ambiguous terms in which their war aims were discussed. Austria was until the death of Emperor Francis Joseph in 1916, unwilling to accept any peace which would leave the Slavs, especially the Serbs, free to continue their nationalistic agitations or the disintegration of the Habsburg Empire. On the other hand, Italy was determined to exclude the Habsburg Empire from the shores of the Adriatic Sea, while the Serbs were even more determined to reach those shores by the acquisition of Habsburg ruled Slav areas in the Western Balkans.